along with Stephanie Taylor as co-founders of Educacy, we wanted to give you a big heartfelt welcome and thank you for joining us here tonight. Like many of you, I'm here because of my children. Two years ago, with the budget cuts, my son's third grade class went from 20 to 27 students. And today, my six-year-old, my first grade daughter, is in a class of 31 students. In my school district, which is the Redwood City School District, our classrooms only get cleaned once every five days. And I can tell you that once that cleaning schedule was implemented, there was a big spike in the number of health notices that went out. But this is just my story. There are many more, and there are many that are worse. But it's not just about the lack of money, although that's a very big part of the problem, but how we spend the money that we do have more effectively, as well as do we need to implement a new teaching methodology, new approaches, new curricula. Those are all things that we need to consider as we look at education reform. Tonight's session is not to lament, though, where we are, but really focus on where we can go if we come together on a shared platform with the unified voices. And Educacy was formed for this purpose. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our moderator, John Marrow. But thank you all for being here. I, the goal, as Kay said, and this is a vibrant organization, and the goal is to really push the inside of the envelope. Uh, we hope that you all, each and every one of you, will leave here uh, this, well, I don't know if increased vigor, because you're a pretty vigorous group, obviously, but maybe increased determination to make things different and better, but, but with some new ideas about how to make things different. In 1968, California's system of funding public schools was challenged in the courts in a lawsuit known as Serrano versus Priest. The theory of those cases was Beverly Hills spends X amount of dollars for its students per pupil, and East LA students get X minus a couple thousand for their students, and that's not okay. So we should equalize funding and that will fix education for everybody. The court agreed and ordered equal school spending across the state. But that did not mean that poor districts got more. What happened then is that we equalized down. So we spent X minus a couple thousand dollars for all students, including Beverly Hills students, which was a plus for no one. California imposed a ceiling, limiting spending to a few thousand dollars per student. Districts that had raised the most money in the past were hit hard. And if their property tax revenue went up, then the state took away state funding. If their property taxes went down, the state backfield. So if you got more property tax revenue in your school district, you just lost state money. Meanwhile, property taxes exploded. Relative property values in California were skyrocketing. It was a time of inflation. People would have a house uh, that they bought for $30,000. It would get reassessed at $150,000. Their property tax would triple. Before long, California had a property tax revolt on its hands led by businessman Howard Jarvis. Jarvis and his supporters demanded a freeze on property taxes for homes and businesses and got it on the 1978 ballot. It was called Proposition 13. Proposition 13 sought not just tax relief, but also protection against future taxes. If passed, it would require new local taxes to be approved by two-thirds of the voters. Much of the state's political and business establishment has lined up against 13. As election day neared, critics of Proposition 13 predicted a devastating effect on schools. Jarvis pushed ahead. Thank you, youngster. Thank you. We're not going to hurt your schools. To the dismay of California's political establishment, Proposition 13 won in a landslide. California felt the effects of Proposition 13 immediately. The first firings were announced in San Diego and a cross-the-board reduction in all county departments. And what will happen in the schools? Summer school went away for my second child because that was one of the first things to be cut. Uh, and the textbooks became older and the special services for 
uh, health became less. It affected a whole lot of other things, arts programs, music programs, phys ed, um, uh, language programs, counselors, nurses, librarians, libraries. They cut the classroom periods from seven periods to six periods, and then some school districts cut to five periods. So we actually cut the school day in high school dramatically. What began as a grassroots campaign in California became a national movement. Its founder, Howard Jarvis, died in 1986. His Proposition 13 is still in effect, along with a legacy of unintended consequences. There's the three part series, and the next part is, you know, that was then, that, that film is five years old. So let's get us, bring us up to date. Would you do that for us, Stephanie? So I'm going to take you through a few things that you may or may not know about the state of California and where we are today. So right now, the ratio of teachers to students um, is 49th out of 51 areas, if you, if you count uh, DC. Our ratio of staff to students is actually 50th, and librarians to students is 51st. And librarians, the, the number of librarians directly corresponds to reading levels and positively affects them at a school. So under, seeing that we don't even have librarians anymore, we have media clerks, it's a real, real shame. Um, the other thing is that our per pupil state funding is significantly lower. Now you can look, there are tons of reports and you can always find something that will support what you want to say. There was a um, recent report that came out from the Education Law Center that actually had California ranked as 31st, but EdSource ranks us at 43rd. So either way, we're significantly at the bottom. And considering we've got the best universities in the world, the UC system, CSU, Stanford, USC, we shouldn't be at the bottom. If we are gonna to continue to have a workforce that's powerful in Silicon Valley and California and sustain our place as the eighth largest economy in the world, we have to invest more money, but we also need to spend it wisely. Now, I'd just like to point out some facts that sort of give you a comparison um, of where we spend our money. So every single prisoner, and there are 170,000 in the state of California, the state spends $58,000 on those prisoners. Now, obviously there's more in, in, in housing a prisoner and feeding a prisoner than there is to just teaching a child, just teaching a child. But that health care cost alone is $11,000. So the health care that we spend on our prisoners is twice what my children receive um, to support their education. We also have a, a great challenge here in California, more so than any other state, and that we have a significant amount of English language learners. And over the past 18 years, that we have increased our English language learners by 378%. It costs a significantly more amount of money to teach children who are also learning the language as well as learning the curriculum. We also have a significant number of children who are receiving free and reduced lunches. It's almost twice what it is nationally. And as uh, we were just talking about a little while ago about the number of school days, a sixth of the districts in California are now down to 175 school days from 180, and I'm sure many of you have experienced uh, in your districts, the teachers had to take furlough days um, last year to, cut, cost, to um, cut costs. And that's compared to 223 uh, school days in Japan. The U.S. has the large, largest economy in the world. California has the eighth largest economy in the world. And Japan has the second largest. And they're teaching their children almost 50 days more a year. As far as graduation from high school, we're slightly lower. We're at 70% versus 74%. And our college graduation rates are comparable to the rest of the nation. But we should be thinking about increasing that because we need to educate our workforce and grow a workforce that doesn't have to go overseas and get work visas from foreign countries. They should be able to pull from the children who are educated in our system. And that's where I see is, is one of the biggest problems. 